second. And thank you so much for being here. This is um, the guest speaker for careers in the visual arts and also for the portfolio class. And um, I'll start out with letting, um, hold on one second while I share my screen. And our, this is the list of our guest speakers for this term. And here is the page for Juan, so you can follow up with him, following up on his websites and his contacts. And so I'm going to stop sharing. Um, and so if you are joining us now, this is being recorded. Um, if you have a question, you can put it in the chat with two question marks. I did have two volunteers to ask questions at the end for extra credit. And I'm just so glad you're all here. So um, Juan, I'm going to um, give it to you if you want to share your screen or you want to sh talk. We're just really super interested in um, the questions that I sent you about what a career in gaming looks like yeah. and how you got where, what you're doing and what's your, what are you most excited about right now? For sure. Yeah. So I think, yeah, I'll, I'll go ahead and start answering some of the questions you sent me. And if, you know, folks have additional questions somewhere in the middle, feel free. I like, you know, I don't know what sort of method you all are using for like raising hands or whatnot, but feel free to ask questions in the middle, but no worries. Um, but yeah, just a short introduction about myself. Uh, my name is Juan Morales Rocha. Uh, I currently work as the undergraduate advisor for the Art and Design Games and Playable Media program at UC Santa Cruz. Um, it's a relatively new uh, Bachelor of Arts program that started in 2015. And I was also, I'm also an alumni of the program. Uh, I graduated in 2017 now. It feels like ages ago. <laughs> uh, 2017, and I was part of the first graduating class that was only like six of us. So now as the advisor, we have like I think our next graduating class is like something like 90, 80 people. So the program has really like grown uh, exponentially and we're doing a lot of cool, awesome things uh, with, within the program. So yeah, a little bit about myself, like what my career is and how I'm sort of connected to gaming. So currently, like I said, I work as the undergraduate advisor for the art and design games and playable media program. Uh, I haven't worked at like a AAA studio or indie company, but I've done a bit of like consulting and freelancing work related to UI, UX and games. Uh, sort of like right now, some of the work that I'm doing relates to like volunteer work and uh, sort of freelancing stuff. So some of the volunteer stuff that I'm doing is helping some friends out with some game UI UX stuff that they're doing for their thesis projects. I have some friends that are doing the Masters of Games and Interactive Media at USC, the University of Southern California, and they're recruited me to help them out with their projects. Um, and then some other stuff, other volunteer stuff that I do is I'm part of the planning committee for what's called the Latinx Games Festival. That's sort of like a new games festival that started last year to get uh, more folks from uh, the Latinx Chicano communities to do, you know, into the industry and sort of build those connections. Um, in terms of like other jobs that I've had, like I've been at anything like from a janitor at a daycare center uh, to like picking raspberries too with like my folks here in the Central Coast. Uh, and then from there, like I got into UCSC, started doing some graphic design, IT type of jobs, did some freelancing as well. And now I'm where I am today, doing like UI UX design stuff uh, on the side while maintaining my nine to five job at UC Santa Cruz as the advisor. Yeah, any questions from, from there? So um, can you, do you have anything you can share, you can show us that, um, I mean, I sure. assume your background is a piece of what, uh, what you've <laughs> done. Like, no, so this is, this, is a, this is a reference to one of the Pokemon games, actually. It's like the intro from an old Game Boy Advance game that I was like, you know, people hopping on with the cool Zoom backgrounds, I definitely had to pay an homage to that. Uh, but yeah, let me see if I can share my screen with y'all. Uh, That'd yeah, be great. The green see. button on the bottom center is the share screen. Yeah, can you, you see? probably well know. <laughs> yes, can you, can you see my stuff? Yeah. So um, the link to this yes. is in that page I showed. So yeah. if mm -hmm. you want to explore deeper later, but share a little bit about the projects that you're most excited about. Yeah, so it's like, so funny enough, I think the one that I'm most excited about right now is this one called Indigestible. So this is, it's like, it's definitely a weird concept, but I was part of this, um, uh, game jam through this website called itch.io where they host a lot of like remote game jams people basically set up like a discord server which is similar to a slack if you're familiar um, to get people from different parts of the world to work together on a game so for this particular project um, it was for a game jam where the theme was passage and a lot of the other submissions that people uh, submitted this was like a weekend thing so like a 48 hour time window to work on something 
Uh, so some people made stuff about boats or traveling places, and I decided to make my game about a little piece of corn that travels through the digestive system. Um, so that's what my game is about, using the theme of passage. Uh, so for the first build, I, I basically made, well, so it's like, this one is one of the first like solo builds that I've done where like basically I do all the programming, the art stuff, and basically try to design it on myself, which is a lot of work. So definitely don't recommend do in a team if you can. Um, but I, I basically had this prototype up and running uh, using Game Maker as the engine for it. Um, and that was like the first round of like me doing something in 48 hours and then stopping. <laughs> then afterwards, uh, I got my brother involved. He does a lot of like sound design stuff. He's, he actually also graduated from the AGPM major which I'm the advisor for. So I was his advisor for a little bit, which is pretty funny. Um, but yeah, so he worked on, on some of the sound stuff with me. And then sort of the more like in-depth stuff that I have in here is some of like the UI um, ideas and things that I had going. So it's like a lot of it when designing the character in the drafts, it's like, what would my level select be? What would my menu look like? So I thought it'd be cool if there was like a corn piece that you would rotate as like the play selection menu and things like that. Um, then like for the health bar, things like could it be like a gradient on a corn piece or maybe like a little uh, emoji like eating down a piece of corn um, as part of representing the health. So there's, yeah, so I made a quick few drafts. This is, I think a video, yeah, of some of the early stuff. So I didn't get the movement of the corn quite there, but that sort of illustrates the illusion of like the text growing bigger, changing sizes and whatnot with some like really basic movement on the background. And then this is an example of some of the um, different like so like selection screen because that's what, one of the things like at first it was just like it'd be a piece of, it'd be cool if it's a piece of corn that goes through one like a human digestive system but then after doing some more research I watched like the magic school bus like digestive tract episode if you've ever seen that um, and it's like there's a lot of different digestive tracts so like ducks have different ones dogs have different ones so I'm thinking of using that as like a way to design different levels around this idea of like food traveling through the body. Um, then for some of the UX stuff, I had a friend of mine work with me on this thing called the corn troller, where we like 3D printed a corn piece and got some pieces for a joystick. And then we got it all together and working. And this is what like the end thing came out to look like. So it's a very weird controller. I showcased it here in Santa Cruz at one of like the open, artists like uh like was it first fridays where all the artists are showcasing their work um and then yeah and a lot i had a really good feedback from people people were like this is a really weird thing and i was like thank you very much um so it was definitely <laughs> really fun to showcase that and then in terms of like stuff like i'm still working on it very like on and off but it's definitely one of uh the fun like solo projects that i'm working on right now for sure yeah very neat i mean that really gives us such a view into sort of the breath of what it takes to build a game because i think some people mm -hmm. here maybe aren't familiar with all the pieces um and so for your your training was mainly you um university of california santa cruz and yes. and, mm -hmm. and just trying stuff and Basically, jumping in yes i feel like yeah the best teacher is definitely the internet <laughs> right so it's like <laughs> one of the things i say is like you know, education is definitely important. So like, you know, when you're guided through what sort of boxes to hit and all that stuff, it's really helpful. But that I feel like that's sort of like just to get you the foundation in terms of building that like building up your craft and your process. A lot of that just comes right. from practice. Right. So it's like, that's I think the hard part that's kind of hard to get a lot in school because like I think even in our program at UCSC, there's really like only like five or six different classes where you're really working on a project with people for like to have different right. basically portfolio pieces. So unless you're doing other stuff, like in addition to that, like extracurricular game projects or your own stuff, it's really easy to get rusty and not, you know, be building your skills um, further basically. Yeah. I, I love that word craft. Cause I do think so many things and people in this class are in multiple different areas. Mm -hmm. um, but all of it has to do with both that balance of craft and vision and the, and bringing that skill that's a matter of practice mm -hmm, you know definitely. that you get better when you do things more mm -hmm. <laughs> yes it's like it's a, it's like the simplest piece of advice but it's really the most true right like just doing yeah. it over and over again is going to just make you better you're going to see stuff that yeah. you didn't see before yeah so what what do you like best about what you do um i think what i like best 
about what I do is sort of like finding like the basically the perfect inter intersection of like form and function, which is like key for like the stuff that I'm interested in. So for me, like my background at UCSC, I started as a computer science game design student. Like that's what I got into at UCSC, but I'm not a big fan of math or programming. I'm really bad at programming. Um, but I ended up switching into cognitive science, which is like psychology, neuroscience. And I did that as uh, in combination with the uh, art and design games and playable media program. So I got like the psych side and then the art and design side to like not only learn how to make games, but also learn about people's relationships to like the certain like design decisions and things like that backed up by like scientific evidence. So it's, right. it's a nice combination of like, like how to make stuff and also like the why do we you know, do certain things. Why do we put buttons here? How do people, like what's people's game literacy look like when they're picking up, you know, a thing like the controller, which is really weird and probably people haven't interacted with it before, right? Uh, so thinking about all those things is, is super interesting. So a lot of problem solving. Um, I think one of the biggest things just about working in games in whatever capacity it is, um, is the community of people that, that exist within it. It's like, you know, a, a lot of the times people think it's like all fun and games because <laughs> you are working on games, but it is a job, right? Um, but a lot, yeah, like, but knowing, you know, getting to know different people from different disciplines, it's like, I don't think there's a more inter interdisciplinary team that you could be working with than one that's making games. Like you have programmers, artists, uh, film folks, psychologists, all this like basically group of people um, trying to make a single product um, together and hoping that it comes out really good. Yeah, that's interesting. I, I do. It's and I wouldn't have. I'm not much of a gamer. Um, mm -hmm. um, I do books though. And when you talk mm -hmm. about it, it's so parallel. Where I'll mm -hmm. make a prototype book and watch people interact with it to mm -hmm. see what's working and what's not in terms of the structure, and mm -hmm. and then working in a team. That's what my best books have happened when it's not working alone, but bringing mm -hmm. together groups of people that have multiple ideas and having that work, both friction and collaboration. So that's Definitely. exciting. Yeah. Is there anything else you, um, another thing you'd like to share and then we'll go to some of the questions from the students? Sure. Um, yeah, I think part of it too, just like, I would say something about like games that's, that's really like important to know is that just like, it's not so much like a lot, like, you know, a lot of the training that goes back, like goes into it. A lot of the times it's just the people that you know. So just thinking mm -hmm. about like, you know, the times that like I've had people like if I'm interested in a job and I could go on LinkedIn and see who's connected to so and so company or works there. It's a really good way to, you know, break into the industry. Right. If, if that's something you're, you're thinking about. So basically one thing that I like about like, you know, part of being in this community is like keeping friends or staying friends with people that you might not be in touch with for a long time. But if if you're not, you know, if you're not burning bridges and if you're being friendly, hopefully someone could come through with a favor later and let you into, you know, get you that interview or help you out that way. Because I've, I've definitely had the experience where I've had some students like that were, you know, my peers, because I also came from the program, uh, apply for a job. Then the person that works at this job is someone that I met at a conference or something. Then they call me to verify like, hey, I know you know this person how good is their work ethic or whatever. I'm like, oh, they're great. I worked on a bunch of projects with them. You should definitely like check out their work and see what's up with, uh, you know, with them joining your company. And then they end up working there. And that's, you know, that's always the best sort of like experience when you're able to connect people to their jobs just by like having that network of friends. So that's super right. helpful, sure. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Well, the first student who has volunteered to mm -hmm. ask questions is Jay Ashir. Mm -hmm. And Jay Ashir, will you unmute yourself and ask your questions? Don't um, Jay, still muted. I'm going to unmute you, Jay Ashir. I hope it's okay. Jay Ashir, are you there for questions? Yes. Yeah. So uh, mm -hmm. my question is. Uh, what are the some of the qualities or talent would you uh, look out for if you're going to hire a junior graphic designer? Mm -hmm. I mean, okay. game designer. Game designer, yeah. So I think like for any sort of like junior or associate type of role that you're looking for, I think a lot of the times like sort of what you're looking for is process more than anything, right? So like one thing that I try to do like in my portfolios is really like save all like the early drafts of stuff 
just because if you if you show your game and it's a nice polished piece at the end like you know if you're not and you're, if you're not sharing what the process your thinking process or thought process behind it was like that's not really helpful so i think definitely in terms of like talent is like being able to keep tabs and like show a progression with your work so you could say like this was the earliest draft of my game then mm -hmm. i you know learned that this wasn't too good of a mechanic so i iterated 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 and this is the final product so some some sort of like narrative behind your projects is really helpful uh just when people are like you know when you're looking at people's portfolios or anything like that um and then in terms of qualities i think it goes back to what i said earlier about like being friendly and not burning bridges mm -hmm. it's like definitely someone it's like having those soft skills is super important where you're able to work collaboratively with people from different backgrounds different disciplines and being able to showcase that in some way. So I think, you know, if, if there's sort of extracurricular things you could be a part of, I think that's also really helpful. It's like if you're okay. part of like a game design club on campus or something like that, that always really looks good on, our, on a resume. And again, it goes back into like building that network of people that can help you out. So, you know, and then you get into the deeper stuff of like, <laughs> like what engines do you know and what tools mm -hmm. do you know? But at the end of the day, like all those tools and things, like each, different studio that you apply for, job you apply for, could be different. So one thing that I tell my students to do early on when, when they're starting at UCSC is to go like on LinkedIn and if you're interested in a job, right? So if you're interested in a junior game designer role, find like 10 different job descriptions for what that role is from 10 different companies and like save them all, put them in PDFs, whatever. And then you, what you wanna do is cross reference all of them. Right. So when you cross reference 10 of them, if 10 or like, let's say if eight of these 10 ask you to know Unity as like a tool that they're, like, you know, experience with Unity, then, you know, that's probably something you want to spend some of your time with. Right. Uh, like working on that. So that way, you know, even if you're not looking for a job right away, it's a good way to see like what skills can you spend time building um, in order to get to that level in a year or two. Right. Sure. Mm -hmm. Thank you. For sure. Okay. I'm here. Thanks up here can you um did you want to ask your question a question now um yeah sure uh can you hear me yes yes Hi. uh so i think my main question was just like you mentioned you're an advisor at mm -hmm. uc santa cruz mm -hmm. so uh for someone looking to get into game design what would be like um some course recommendations mm. yeah so if you're trying to get into game design like so are you mean do you mean just like at ucs you're just in general like topics to take um, what are you thinking? Well, uh, both. Like, okay, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. So if for folks who are wanting to transfer to the EGPM program, the requirements are, are relatively simple. Like I would say it's, it takes work to get there, but they're relatively simple. Like it's, it's twofold. So you'll need to satisfy all the requirements for like the general UCSC admissions process. Right. So that's mm -hmm. one part of it, which I'm not super familiar with, but I have like the contact information of the person you can talk to if you want to reach out to them. They're like the Foothill um, UCSC liaison. Um, so if you want to check in with them about that, you could check in with them. Um, but for our side, what we're looking for is people to have up to a certain level of programming experience. So like, as I said, like I'm not the best programmer, but even though like our program is a BA, games just sort of innately require or digital games require like having some programming foundations. So we ask that folks take that before they try to transfer over to UCSC. And then the other stuff is just some basic like art and design courses, which I'm sure that y'all have taken some like myriad of different types of those classes before. So I think you probably have those covered, but in terms of the programming side, that's the, you know, the requirements that we would ask folks to complete before they arrive. But then, you know, if you're just looking for classes to take i think really it's like so it's, it's like two two ways it could go so one obviously if there's a game design class at your school take that like whatever like you know you can't really go wrong with taking some sort of game design course mm -hmm. like really even if you wanted for yourself to just you know take um like or go on youtube and take some uh like you know youtube courses tutorials on how to use unity or how to use some basic tools that's a good way to just get started uh, but even more than that, like one thing I'll say for like just game design in general, it's, it's a big part of it is really pulling from different uh, parts or like different disciplines and different things that you know, right? Because if, if all you're taking is just games classes and arts classes, or even, you know, games and programming, you're not really getting influenced by like different like cultures or different, you know, basically different disciplines. So your mm -hmm. stuff could be end up being really stale. So a lot of the times what makes really good games is putting a lot of like your personal experience 
or like if you're trying to make like an autobiographical game for example that's a good way to like put as much of yourself into your own projects and build from there and yeah and then the way i'll just finish it off is like you don't necessarily need a class to get started in games you know like if we're on zoom hopefully you have a computer <laughs> and that's like all it takes really to just get started you don't you know, one thing I'll say too, it's just like, you don't need to be in, in a game design program to call yourself a game designer, right? Like all you need really is a computer and like the passion and desire to get started with something. So even, you know, if you don't, if you're not making the next Minecraft or Call of Duty, that's fine. Um, you know, not everyone's going to get there, but if you just want to start making some like branching narrative, really basic, like, you know, story, visual novel type of games, that's something that should be really easy to pick up and just like, you know, start taking you down that path of, of becoming a game designer. All right. Thank you. Thank you up here. Um, Kelsey, you have a question in the chat. Would you want to, can you um, unmute and ask your first question in the chat? Uh, sure. Um, I have Thank you, Kelsey. I don't have to do all of mine. Um, mm -hmm. I was wondering if you know if big companies like AAA companies, do they have different um, UI UX departments for mobile versus PC versus console mm. gaming? Or do they all kind of go back and forth? Mm -hmm. um, depending on when the release schedule is. It, it really depends on how, you know, how big the companies are, right? Um, but I think you can get like, it's like, it's weird because a lot of the times, I think one of the things I'll say about UI UX right now, it's like, it's getting better within the games industry, but there's been a little bit of like stepping on toes in the like the previous years of like game designers sort of butting heads with UI UX people because it's like, you're sort of taking over my job as a game designer, but that's not really what it is, right? So slowly people are getting more and more UI UX folks uh, within those, uh, like, you know, those companies, but it really depends on how big these teams are for for doing that work so i definitely know of places where it's just like one person and they're in charge of all the you know all the different like dimensions and things for like console versus the port to pc and all these different machines so they're having to keep track of all that stuff themselves uh but definitely when you have a team um like let's say like i think like the destiny team uh like destiny 2 like they have really good good ui really good ui team to do a lot of that stuff for like the different um sort of um what's the word I'm looking for? Like restrictions or criteria that they have to satisfy with like console and all this stuff. So it's like, it's definitely a combination of people and you, you can have a place where you're like the console UI UX person lead mm -hmm. and then the PC, you know, lead, but it, it's like, it depends on how big and how invested the company is for, you know, sort of boosting up the UI UX of their certain product for sure. Okay. Um and I know Jay Ashir had more questions, so I'll go back to him and then back to Kelsey. Mm -hmm. And Amanda, you'll be next if um, you, if you want to read your question. So Jay Ashir, did you have another question that you wanted to ask for, for one? Yeah, so um, uh, my question is like, uh, why is it important to have more than one person creating a game? Mm -hmm. I think, so it's like, it's important. I was like, well, I think the biggest reason is just so you don't get burnt out. It's like as someone has who's done like solo projects, it's like it's very hard to keep track of all the little sub pieces that go into games, right? Because if you think about it, if you're trying to make a digital game, like even the most basic of digital games, mm -hmm. like the, the sort of the disciplines or roles or hats that you have to wear, there's a lot, right? So if you're doing the art, you're the artist. If you're designing okay. the levels and all that stuff, you're the designer slash programmer because you're mm -hmm. implementing those. Then you have music then you have, you know, you have like all these different sort of aspects that you'll have to like cover if you're just doing yeah. it by yourself. So when you could sort of offload that and delegate that to different people, that's sort of like yeah. a good way to just set that up. Um, so at UCSC, one of like the first classes that you take um, is this uh, Foundations of Video Game Design class. And in that one, it's sort of you work in a team of like one or two people or mm -hmm. sorry, like two or three people. And then you sort of give, like you sort of break down the roles amongst each other. So like uh, what our usual breakdown could look like is like maybe person A is like an artist and producer. So they're like the artist for the team and they're also managing like the team dynamics and like, you know, setting up meetings, taking notes, things like that. Uh, then person B could be the game designer and writer. So they're one implementing a lot of stuff into the engine, but they're also working on, you know, writing the story and making all that, um, 
you know, all that basically connect to the game, final game you're working on. And then person C could be a sound designer. So, you know, you need to, if you're wanting sound okay. in your game, they could handle that as well as the programmer for doing some of the more heavy stuff. Like if you're adding some sort of like uh, native uh, dialogue system or something like that, that would need some heavy programming stuff. Uh, you could divvy it up that way. But it's like during the first few years at UCSC, you'll probably take on a bunch of different hats if you, mm -hmm. you know, at least for our program. So like, I've definitely done the programming part, which I didn't like. I've done the artist part, which I really liked. Uh, and then game designer for sure. Um, I was also one of the top ones that I really enjoyed too. Sure. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, James. Too. Um, Kelsey, did you have another question? And then, and then we'll go to Amanda. If... Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. Um, for your own personal projects, do you code them yourself or do you have people you collaborate with? Uh, for the for the indigestible one i did it myself and it was a headache <laughs> it's like definitely don't recommend unless yeah like but that's the thing like yes if you could collaborate and get people to work with you definitely do that right because it's like if if you have an idea of what your focus is going to be i think it's good to try to like deep dive to that uh, at least you know somewhat where instead of trying to like divvy up your knowledge of like okay i'm going to spend you know like a few hours following these tutorials on how to implement a movement system when you could just get that from someone who knows in like an hour, that's definitely a better use of your time. But you know, if you're, if I think for me, at least it's good to, it's a good way to just get a better idea of what programmers or designers have to go through. Right. Even though that's not the career path that I think I'm going to end up doing later on, I think it's good to have that foundational knowledge. And that's sort of what you'll cover at UCSC too, is like getting some of that, um, what is it? It's like exploring the different buckets of game design to see what's like the best fit for you. Um, so yeah, it's like definitely if you could get people to join you, um, definitely do that for sure. Okay. okay Amanda, <laughs> can you um, see if you can unmute? Amanda's still here. Mm -hmm. hmm, there you um, are. I just have really basic questions. Um, one is, uh, if you can just sort of high level explain the difference, like using your digestible game as an example, the difference mm. between the UI part, the UX mm. part, and mm. what would be game design mm -hmm. uh, versus programming. Mm -hmm. And um, um, and then I have a couple quick questions after that. All right, let's see. Let's see if I can do this well. Uh, let me hop on over here. Can you all see my screen again? Yes. yes. Okay. Looks so, good. yeah. So UI versus UX design. The the <laughs> tail is oldest time, hardest question ever. Not not really, but it's it's really confusing, especially with the big studios too. Um, so basically, a good way that you could think of UI design is sort of like the the direct connection to like graphic design, as you would think, like making icons, making art. Uh, the user interface, uh, like what people are going to see, I think is the best way that, to describe it. Um, for UX design, the user experience side of it, it's more of like what people are feeling when they're going through the interactions of doing stuff, right? So like going off of this, so for the UI design, right? So the UI of this is, or like, so for this example, the menu right here, it's like, that's UI. It's like my play button and stuff, it's going to be there with a piece of corn and it's going to rotate right but then or i guess the rotation part connects more to the ux side it's like these are the options this is what they're going to see but how are they going to interact with it right so it's like are they going to hit a key down and that's going to go down that's part of the user experience side right or is it a click menu do you just select the thing with your mouse and that's what you select and that's how you interact with the game so thinking about that is is really important um when you're thinking about the ux side the the i guess directly connected to my project, I went a little bit deeper on the UX side where I made a custom controller for my game, which you definitely don't need to do, but it's like thinking about like how, how will people experience this game in, or at least for me, is like how will people experience this game in like a public setting? Like if I'm trying to showcase this, it's like if I have a game on the screen, like that's all in like good and well, but if I could make something to like draw people in, to like my exhibit or my table. I thought that would be interesting, which is why I made like this really basic controller. Um, and it worked, like people were like, what's that? What's that glowing controller in the corner? So it's like, it sort of piqued people's interest as like, and that's one of the things, right? Like the user experience of a product starts from like square one, like not really opening up the game, but like first, like when you see, if you're thinking about like something in a store, when you see the cover art for a game or you hear about it in a trailer, 
that's your first sort of exposure to it. So then if that could connect you to becoming like a customer or a player or a user or whatnot, that's sort of what it entails. It's like the whole journey of like being a stranger and then being someone who uses this product or, or the plays the game. Right. So that's like the really high level stuff. I think I was like, I hope that's a good explanation. Yeah. <laughs> but do you have anything else? Um, to be in the field is pretty much a prerequisite to fit in and be a good match to be a gamer oneself. No, not at all. Like, yeah. So like, you don't have to be a ga like a gamer if anything it's good to have a nice mix of people who play games and don't play games because if you have people that just play games all the time like i play games a lot i'm always trying to describe stuff in ways that just relates it back to other games which isn't really like building any sort of innovation right it's just like oh do you know how this game did this thing like this other game that came out 20 years ago or whatever and like people understand that and like you know some of the people you talk to get that but then when you have people it's like you know um, like a professor, like you're building a book, maybe the interface for your game is like a flip book or something like that. And you might not get some, like, it's like, oh, what if the interaction for this was like, you know, people flipping through a book or something. And that's, you know, some of those little like pockets of knowledge you won't get from people who just play games. So the more diverse your background is, whether it's like, you know, in screen printing, a uh, graphic design or whatnot, it's like, it's, it's a good way. It's something you could definitely bring into games in whatever shape or way you think would work best. Yeah. That's helpful. And my last question is um, mm -hmm. for 3D versus 2D, do people tend to specialize and in, uh, in do they really differentiate? Yeah, I think so. It really depends where you're trying to go with it, right? Like I think right now, obviously there's a big emphasis on 3D art, right? In terms of just like modern stuff. And then, you know, looking at more into like the distant future or not so distant future, uh, like with augmented reality and virtual reality type of work. But just because that's sort of where the emphasis is, you know, using tools like Maya or Blender to like do 3D modeling, that doesn't mean that like 2D is just going to disappear, right? Like even things like UI, like a lot of the UI stuff in these like VR spaces, it's still 2D stuff. That's just like given that like 3D aesthetic or like perspective per se. So depending what sort of projects you're trying to do, um, it, you know, I think it's good to specialize one way or the other, but if you're able to do both, like, definitely try to like see where you think you'd fit in better, right? Because I know for me, like I had to take some 3D modeling classes. I was not a big fan of 3D modeling. Like, it's like, I couldn't wrap my head around it too much. So instead I focused a lot of my stuff on like learning some basic like animation stuff on After Effects and 2D stuff. So if I do make 2D stuff, I can make it very juicy and animated for like the micro interactions that go into like the user experience side of it. Uh, or the user, user interface side of it. Um, so it's like wherever your strengths are, make sure you know you focus on that for a little bit, but also don't put all your eggs in one basket. Like if you have time and can explore other different alternatives of like different disciplines, that's definitely really good to do too. Mm -hmm. like good advice, thanks. For sure, it's like, I am an advisor, so. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I know Kelsey, Jay, Jerashi, or Ab, here if you have additional questions or if anyone else that's on the call would like to ask a question. Um, I had a quick question. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so I was just, I, w I wanted to know, um, like your, your personal website, um, mm -hmm. it looks really great. And we've kind of been discussing like using websites to like put our portfolio on mm -hmm. and stuff. So mm -hmm. I was wondering if you could tell us like what tools or um, you use to create it. For sure. Yeah. So I use, it's a WordPress website. It's pretty, pretty easy. Uh, I use this plugin called Elementor, which is um, here. Let me see. Maybe I should just share my screen. Hopefully I don't break my website because that'd be hilarious. <laughs> but yeah, let me see. Cause I haven't touched it in a while, but so as you can see, so I could go in here with this thing that says edit with Elementor. And then if you click on that, it makes it very easy to like go ahead and edit different boxes of text. So here's like my panel here. Um, here's like certain, so as you can see right here, there's like different images and things I could move in there. So I could like go ahead, drag this in here, just basic drag and drop stuff. And then I could be like, hello. And then that's like part of like the basic formatting that I do on my website. So it's like, it's, it's a WordPress website with the Elementor plugin. And then a lot, a little bit of like the styling and stuff is some basic CSS stuff. Uh, 
So like learning some basic stuff or like getting some hover effects or, you know, setting up some image containers. It's like some really basic HTML, CSS sort of things. But yeah, it's, it's a really easy, or at least for my website, I try to make it as easy as possible to update in the future. So none of it's like hard coded or anything like that. And I've used a bunch of different things like carbon made is also a good one. If you've used that one before, um, I don't know if I have my carbon made website still up. No, I'll see if I could find it later. Um, but yeah, like, so carbon made is also like a portfolio um, type of website that you could do use um, for your projects. If you want to use that one, I've also used Squarespace if that like, so I've definitely bounced around a bunch of different ones. And I just found that this one in particular was the cheapest to maintain because Squarespace is expensive as well as like the easiest to maintain for me. Um, and like for me, since I'm working right now as an advisor, I don't need to showcase a lot of my stuff super often, but if I ever do need to, oh, here, I found my uh, carbon made one. So let me see if I can share that with you all. So, so in, in the assignment, you'll have, we have links to Squarespace and WebPress. Mm -hmm. I don't have carbon made up there, but um, so I they have a list of, of for the um, portfolio people, this, mm -hmm. this is two classes. Yeah, so like this is like, go. So like even this one, it, like the carbon, the new WordPress website that I have is basically this like very similar format as this carbon made one, uh, which is like basically images, text, images, text. Here's like some like UI stuff that I had for this particular game. Uh, then some sketches of some icons along with like how the icons came out and like the final one. So yeah, so it's, I would say it's like, cause you could get a lot of different answers from different people and like, what's the best tool? What's the best website? What's the best way to do it? But I think really what you would want is just like, if you could have some sort of like design diary or journal where you're keeping track of the work that you're doing outside of a website, that's like really all you need. Cause that's what you're going to want to pull from anyway. Once you have your stuff ready to showcase, right? Mm -hmm. um, it's like if you're if you're constantly keeping track of you know the different files like the like the first version, second version, the stuff that you're designing, you could just reference that all back when you decide to put up your website and and then talk about it, right? Like this was the first thing I decided to make because I thought it looked cool. After looking at it, it didn't look cool, so I decided to change X Y Z about it. And that's really like how you how you build the content in your portfolio. At least that's how I do it. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you up here. Other questions from anybody? I'll go again. Mm -hmm. um, I was wondering okay. what you think are the best and worst examples of game UI UX in your Ooh. personal opinion? Ooh, that's hard. Um, I don't know about worst. I'm like, it's hard to think of worst. Uh, well, actually, okay. There's this game that's really fun for the Wii. <laughs> it's an old game, but it's called Let's Tap. Um, and the UX for that is really bad because basically what you do is that you put a controller on a cardboard box and then you smack the box to select different things. So if you tap it once, it moves the menu down. And then if you tap twice, you could select an option. So it uses the accelerometer, I believe, uh, on the Wii remotes to basically select through the menus. And it's really weird. It's a very fun game because you do like little stick figure racing type of stuff and you run by smacking uh, the cardboard box and then tapping hard to make the character jump. So it's a good game, but the menu is atrocious. In terms of best, um, I think, hmm, I think Journey is a really good example of like good UX. Like, and even like the UI, it's like, it's very simplistic. Funny enough, uh, my boss <laughs> or the director of the AGPM program, Robin Honecky, it was the producer for Journey. So she like, she has a bunch of cool stories to share about that. But that game is just really pretty, looks really well. I think the, what I really like is when the UI sort of like just blends in with, you know, with the world or it's almost like invisible. Cause that's what, when you know you did a good job. But you could show the least amount of information and people still get what they need to do. That's when you know you sort of hit the jackpot in making an experience that's accessible and easy to understand for basically anybody. So I think mm -hmm. definitely journeys up there. Um, I also have a question about like work-life balance. I feel like from what I hear um, in mm. the gaming industry, there's mm. really long hours. Do you think that mm. also applies to the UX UI designers? That seems Definitely. Yeah. Like I think it's, it's a balance too, right? Cause it's like, I think more, yes, it exists in the industry. One of the recommendations I was going to make for folks is if you haven't seen this video, there's this video that came out last year 
from uh, the Patriot Act. I think it's on YouTube with Hassan Minaj about it's called like the dark side of the gaming industry. Um, I definitely recommend taking a look at that because it goes into detail about like the different things that the industry is still like struggling with, which is like crunch, like work conditions, things like that, because it's very real, right, to try to think about that. So um, yeah, like even UI UX people like within the games industry, I think it's definitely connected to just how the industry functions. But it's like, usually, or the way people describe it, and I have like friends that, that you know, could attest to this is like, they have a 40 hour work week usually, but then when they get close to launch or close to release, it's like they could start working, you know, like 60, 80 hours a week just to get done by the certain deadline. And then it sort of comes down again. But even then that seems really like drastic. So that's definitely like one of my like least favorite parts of the industry is like hearing of like my friends, like sort of like having to struggle with this sort of like idea of crunch and, and working like crazy hours um, in addition to what they're doing already. So yeah, it's definitely something that's real, uh, even like no matter what role you have. But I think a lot of that also goes into when you're looking for a job is doing your research or if you know people that work there, checking in with them to see what they could tell you about like the company culture and how it relates to like, you know, like the work ethic or what the expectations are of employees, um, since that's something, you know, that you should want to consider before making the jump to somewhere new. Thanks. For sure. That sort of leads into Maria's question. Maria, do you want to unmute and um, express some of the continuation of what uh, Juan was talking about? Uh, yes. Uh, so what are the struggles of being a part of game art industry? Mm. I think the struggles of being part of like just the gaming industry, partly, you know, yes, partly in the art, but just in general is that it's like a very saturated market of people, right? Like there's a lot of people who want to work in games. So it's like, you definitely, it's like, that's where it goes back to like, connecting to, with the right people, like knowing the right people to get a job and then also having the skill set to like showcase that you're, you know, at a place that would you would be able to take on like a junior artist role or anything like that, right? So I think definitely the, the struggle of being part of like the art side of it is that there's obviously great art, artists everywhere. And like even, I guess, especially now with what's happening in the world, it's like, you know, sometimes these companies have like these remote positions uh, where they like, you know, basically they can pick any of the best talent from the world and let them work at your company, right? Uh, one, one advantage I'd say we have is, as folks, you know, if you're in California is that there's a big scene of game design stuff here. So like whether it's like in the Bay Area or it's down in LA, there's a lot of different companies and studios that are like looking to hire folks like around here, right? Versus somewhere, you know, somewhere else, uh, you might not have the same opportunities. So thinking about that, um, I think is also important, but definitely it's just like, there's a lot of people, not a ton of jobs. And even when there are jobs, thinking about like the security of it and crunch culture and all that other stuff that's connected to it too. Thank you very much. And one mm -hmm. more question. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, can you have financial stability while doing a job in game art? Um, I think you can. I think a lot of it also depends on the company that you're working for, right? And how, what sort of protections you're getting. So one of the big things right now too that's been happening in the industry is this idea of like unionizing the game workforce. Um, since that's not something that like a lot of tech uh, companies and folks, you know, in the Silicon Valley have like, uh, like basically like protections against unfair labor practices, right? So I had, I don't know if y'all familiar with like the Telltale Games uh, no. <laughs> series, um, but they're like, they did uh, The Walking Dead, they did like these narrative games before and they were like, for a few years, they were like, oh, these, this is like the epitome of what a good narrative game looks like. And then what happened was I had a few friends that worked there. Um, they ended up like firing everyone after like losing some funding and they had like 30 minutes to vacate their offices, which is really rough. So in that video about like the dark side of the video game industry, uh, that I talked about, um, there's there, I'm spacing on their name, but the person that's on there talks about their experience at Telltale and what sort of happened when this happens. And what's what's rough about the games industry is that they're like this idea of like people being let go happens a lot, right? It's sort of like this idea of like people working really hard, they finish a game, and then after the game is finished, they like, all right, we finished the game, thank you for your job, and that's why it's good to be looking at like the, the history of the games. Yes, there you go, thank you. <laughs> um, <laughs> thank you. Yeah, so yeah, I definitely recommend taking a look at that just to get a better idea. It's like a very easy to digest way to get an understanding of what the industry looked like like a year ago, and it's probably still very much there. 
Thank you so much for the explanation. For sure. Oh, so I think you're muted, Kate. So um, Avi has a question, but doesn't have a microphone. So okay. I'm now that I'm unmuted, will actually be asking <laughs> the question. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the request is, could you briefly cover the roles process of the game design from start to published marketing? Um, mm -hmm. And any specific things you know or have learned about the process? I mean, some, he said he or mm -hmm. she. I don't know if Abby's a girl or a boy. Sorry. Um, mm -hmm. If you know something that you could Google, but the mm -hmm. question is, you know, could you sort of give that mm -hmm. overview yeah. of you know from spark to mm -hmm. to end? Yeah. End. So I think like really the beginning part of as with any project is just having an idea and putting it on paper. Because I think if you're not putting it somewhere where you're keeping track of like the ideas that you'll have, it's easy to just lose track. So basically one of the first steps is making a game design document, which is basically like a breakdown of all the information you know so far and with like basically empty points where you're gonna add the additional information that you're missing. So when I make a game design document, it's basically like, um, or here, maybe I, let me see if I could find one of my old ones <laughs> and I could share it with you and that makes sense, hopefully. Um, let's see. Let's see, okay. Um, let's see, oh, there we go. Yeah, so let me go ahead and share my screen. So yeah, the first part is making a design document that like summarizes your game and what you're like what the gameplay is gonna be. So this is for the indigestible like game jam stuff that I had is like, who's gonna be working on it, the, the platform, the theme, who the target audience is, uh, what the gameplay looks like. So I have basic mechanics like walking, jumping, whatnot, and then the design for your game. So like things like characters, like who, who are gonna be the characters, what's the story, some uh, animations or drawings and sketches of what you're imagining a lot of that gameplay would look like, some story stuff, how you're gonna build the game, and different sort of resources for that, right? So, and then you get more into like the publishing side. But, so what I'll say is first things first, is make a design document. Step two, make a prototype of like, you know, what it's gonna look like and go from there. Um, then, you know, once you have a nice polished prototype and this is like, this could take anywhere from like a few months to a few years, like it depends how deep you're trying to go to. And then if you're wanting to release it out, like, you know, to put it to market, it depends what you're trying to do, right? If you're trying to just put it on itch.io, which is like a free sort of website, you could do that when it, for, with whatever project you want, like it doesn't take you anything. So that would be, you know, it's in market, it's done, it's published, people could play it. Um, if you're thinking about doing it with like a console or putting it on the Steam store or like the Apple uh, app store, those processes are a little bit more difficult. You have to get like certain licensing or clearance, like green light your project in certain ways to get those out to those bigger markets. Uh, but that's really where you're getting into like trying to make like money out of these projects that you're working on. And hope, unless like you're super, super good, you probably won't be making really great projects off the get go. Uh, so like, when you're making projects in like teams and things like that, that's a good time to look into, you know, if you think you have a really good idea and your demo is looking really great, then it's a good way to like, then it's good to start thinking about like, you know, people like that would be willing to put some money uh, and funding into the project so you could continue working on it. Hope that answers the question. <laughs> Thank you. Um, other questions? Anything else? I'll, I'll keep going. Yeah, sure. I just I just don't want to hog <laughs> the time. Um, are game UX UI designers uh, often programmers, or it just depends on the company? Yeah, well, it, yeah. So it definitely depends. So like for me, it's like I found that for like you know solo projects or small groups, definitely like I've had to be the one to do like the programming or implementation into the engine of my UI, just because like trying to explain it to someone sometimes doesn't do the trick so doing it yourself is better um but yeah like what i'd say is like it, especially when you're looking at these big uh, AAA companies they will likely have people that do the programming part for you right or they'll do that like they'll they're called like ui engineers or ui programmers they'll do that part of it but then you know 
depends how the split is because you know sometimes you could be doing ux and but the ux that you're doing is more like ux research instead of ux design which the research part is like interviewing players uh running play tests getting data statistics um and that's more of like the cognitive science side of the stuff that i've done um and then the ui stuff right is very like in like illustrator doing actual assets icons things like that Right. So it depends where you go. But usually if you're working at a triple A company, they'll have someone to cover your the programming stuff separate from the design uh, and, impl and implementation parts of it. Yeah. Sure. And then I had one more question. Um, mm -hmm. I, I hear that a lot of UI UX designers kind of have to defend their jobs a lot, like mm -hmm. <laughs> and their process. Do you think mm -hmm. that's that applies in the game? Like um, what? I guess if I were a game designer, I would be like, well, that's my job, you know? Yeah, like, exactly, what, right? How do you defend your job title? Yeah, so I think there's a really good book called uh, The Gamer's Brain, I believe, by uh, Celia Hodent, I would recommend. I've heard of it. I haven't read it yet. Yeah, yeah. So that's the person that I had my, my Twitter chat call with, Celia. So, but, so like before her book was released, she was down to talk to me. But yes, like, so in that book, she breaks down a lot of like, what reservations people have or like what sort of like how to sort of try to build like UX within a studio without people feeling threatened. And it's basically sort of explaining it that you're not like the feedback that you're providing as a UX designer is not like your personal preference or your personal idea of like what you're pitching forward, right? Like you're trying to pull yourself away from your biases and your assumptions and basically go off of the data that you're collecting from your players and be like, you know, people didn't understand this level. And then that's where the game designers might be, but like, oh, but no, but it has to be like this. It's like, well, like, you know, according to like the data we have, people aren't getting it this way. So, you know, trying to describe that it's not, you're not necessarily trying to change their game uh, for them. Um, it's more of like, you're just trying to, you know, you're working collaboratively to try to make uh, you know, help the designer reach the final vision of what they're trying to go for, right? And I think there's a really good example of like people, I think they brought up like Dark Souls, which are like the really like hard games. And people are like, no, if I have a UX designer, they're gonna like ruin my Dark Souls because they're gonna make everything too easy. But it's like, no, like if you're trying to, you know, if you're trying to make your game hard, then the UX designer can make it hard. Like it helped like give you the difficulty in the areas that you need it. When if you're trying to make something like a Kirby game or something more casual, you know, they could help you uh, avoid any like obstacles that you know casual gamers might have uh, when trying to access your game. So really it's sort of helping like the job of a UX designer in games is really like assisting with the game designers and getting into the final vision of what they're trying to go for. And that's usually what like you know people are like why are you doing this? I was like I'm just trying to help you. That's like that's it. That's my job. So that's usually what I would, would say. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Juan. I really appreciate you being here. I've put in the chat both the dark side of the video gaming industry from Patriot mm -hmm. Act, the link to the UC Santa Cruz design and playable game website. Mm -hmm. um, so as some people are looking to transfer and or um, what's next steps, this could mm -hmm. be, and um, I'll just um, share that. And then I've also put in the chat the link to the book that you mentioned. And I'll awesome. also copy those chat links over to um, the, the, the web page we have on Juan so you can follow mm -hmm. up on, on some of the things he's shown. Um, do you have any closing words that you want to say or anything? Um, <laughs> yeah, like I would say, well, thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate the opportunity you know, to, to chat with y'all. Um, if you have any other questions later on, feel free to reach out to me. Um, I don't know, like if, if Kate could give you my website or if you want my email, uh, it's just juanmr at ucse.edu. If you want to reach out to me, feel free to, to hit me up. But yeah, just like a few things I would say uh, for, you know, like of when I started and things that would have been good to hear, uh, like just as students get, trying to make their way there, right, is like, again, try not to burn bridges, be friendly. You never know where people are going to end up. And a big part of breaking into the industry is just knowing the right people. So try to, you know, keep those connections uh, and work hard. Uh, one thing, another thing I'll say is like, um, it's like, it's a bit counterintuitive. It sounds a little weird, but the sooner you could stop thinking of yourself as a, as just a student, the better. Like, so it's like, what I mean by this, it's like when you're working on a design project for a class, or at least for me, like I've definitely gotten like, maybe like, I'm like, all right, that's good. That's an A, that's good enough, right? But if you're willing to put in that extra effort into the project, um, it, it's really where you get into that potential of like portfolio piece um, by like, you know, working, a, like, you know, spending more time on it than just like the base level minimum. So I definitely say like, 
that's a good sort of mentality or mindset to, to go forward with, with your practices. Like you're not just a student, you're, you're a student now. Yes. But you're, you're trying to, you know, when you're competing for jobs, you're not going to be competing with just other students, you know, you're competing with everyone. So thinking about that. Um, and then, you know, it's never too early to get started too. It's just like, you could call yourself a game designer. Like all you need again is just like a computer and then the passion to try to sort of figure some stuff out um, by yourself. And obviously, you know, if you need some help, I'm definitely available. Feel free to reach out. Happy to chat um, again if, if you need it. But also like, you know, Kate mentioned in the beginning, don't feel like, you know, if you need to reach out to someone in the industry, don't feel bad about reaching out. Like the worst thing that could happen is they just don't respond to you. And then you're back at square one and you could reach out to someone else. But I've definitely had some, built some really good connections with people by just doing like, you know, the cold email, cold reaching out and, and starting, you know, those friendships and those connections that way. Um, so yeah, that's basically, that's basically it for me. Thank y'all for having me. Appreciate it. Such wisdom that will be good for everyone, whether they are going into <laughs> gaming or not. Thank mm -hmm. you, Juan. I so of much course. appreciate you being here. Thank you to all of the careers in the visual arts and portfolio students are here. And um, we will, uh, I will post up on the website some of the links. And if you have any questions, contact me about the class or Juan, as he also yeah. is so kind to offer. Mm -hmm. Thank right. you. Thank you all. Take it. Bye-bye. See ya. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.